Okay, thanks for that uh, lovely story. So today, uh, I don't know how about you guys, but I, had, I struggled to wake up after that amazing excursion to Jerusalem. So we're going to start with something light and then get more sort of syntactic as the day, day goes on, okay? And we are going to bash things, okay? <laughs> we're not going to be as nice as, as Yoda, because the things we are bashing are really, you know, large browsers and, uh, and big companies making software. We don't feel bad about them. They're not cryptographers. Anyway, so the, um, so the basic things that you've learned in the last few days of this school are various principles and various methods by which you can build provably secure key exchange protocols. And that's perfect, and that's how you should be designing your protocols. And if you can find a situation where you've designed and verified, proved, secure a protocol, and you're able to deploy exactly the protocol as you have designed it, uh, that's great. That's the perfect ideal situation. However, in the real world, typically, there are large gaps between the protocol that we have in our papers, that we prove, prove things about, and the protocol that's actually deployed in, uh, in, the, in the internet. Right? So there are at least two kinds of gaps that you can commonly see. First, there's some sort of formal, sort of classic protocol that someone has designed, and, uh, and sort of we have lots of uh, reasons to believe that this is secure. And then by the time it kind of evolves and becomes incorporate into, incorporated into a protocol standard like TLS, for example, or, or IPsec or SSH, there have been many changes to it. So there's a little bit of a gap between the academic protocol, so to speak, and the, and the standard protocol. And then from the time that the protocol becomes a standard to the time it's actually implemented and deployed on the internet, there are lots and lots of decisions that have to be made too. And this also increases the number of gaps. So when you have these kinds of gaps between what we have actually proved and what is actually run, that's, that's, that's sort of a point of danger because these gaps are where often attacks come from. So the first part of this uh, for today, the first two hours, let's say, we'll try to explore these gaps and these corner cases and see what is the boundary between secure and insecure as we kind of push these boundaries, okay? And then what we'll do later on is to see how we can use automated tools to try to find these kinds of gaps or to kind of do, uh, to machine check the proofs that you're making and make sure that they actually hold in the full model which might be too complex to handle by hand, but we might be able to handle using, uh, using automated tools. All right, so as usual, for as for all the uh, many of the lectures here, we're going to use as our motivating example TLS, more specifically the way TLS is used on the web, which is called HTTPS. So this is my bank, which I often go to, and uh, the classic thing here is that there is a nice little green bar on top which tells me, don't worry, you're connected to HSBC and that's uh, server authentication that's given to me by uh, TLS. And then it says it's okay for you to put in your username and password here. If you do, then I will show you your account details. And this username and password, obviously I'm hoping, is going uh, via a secure channel to the, to the, to the site, uh, to, the, to, the, to my bank website. So I want confidentiality for the stuff on the page, and I want server authentication at least. Of course, I want integrity too. So this is a classic secure channel that I'm asking for. And tomorrow I think we'll see some definitions of what this kind of secure channel definition really is in the sense of uh, TLS as well. And you've seen some of uh, hints of this already with, with Mark's lectures. But even though this is more or less a standard thing and knowing the techniques that we know already, how to build secure AKEs, how to build secure AEADs, we should be able to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It still turns out that in the recent past even, just in the last two or three years, there's been a whole bunch of attacks on that exactly that kind of screen. I mean, that connection between me and my bank. It's in fact, specifically for HSBC as well, many of these things actually hold because HSBC doesn't have a very good uh, website administrator, I guess. And the ones in red here are attacks on the key exchange aspect of it. Okay. So there are a whole bunch of bugs that come up in the key exchange, the so-called handshake of TLS. And we're going to try to see where these things are coming from. Okay. So especially when they're getting all more and more high profile every year. So the first part, we're going to basically just look at some attacks, just to try to understand what are the kinds of attacks that are coming up, why are, you know, why are, they, uh, why are they actually uh, affecting the internet, how can we can fix them, and so on. And then the rest of the day will be about how, to, how can we use tools to improve them. So the slides I gave you, and I can see many of you flipping slides, are a vast superset of what we will discuss, because I will decide based on how fast we go and, uh, and what the interests are and what part of this we will go through. Okay, so don't worry, it's not going to be all of it, but also if you need to, you can look at uh, it for reference. So let's just look at uh, attacks on the AKE aspect of TLS, and I'm going to try to avoid 
going very detailed into TLS, but at least to begin with, well, there's a bunch of papers that you can read. Let's just sort of have an overview. Everybody knows what TLS is here at this point in the school. It's probably the most widely known uh, used uh, secure channel protocol. It has many, many implementations, actually. It's many versions uh, from SSL 2, in fact, all the way to TLS 1.3, which hopefully is coming out in a couple of months, but we don't know. Uh, and it has many implementations, and you're using these implementations even though you don't know them. If you have an iPhone, you're using something called Secure Transport. If you're using a Windows machine, you're using something called S-Channel. All the servers around are probably using OpenSSL. If you're using Java, you're using something called Oracle Java JSSE, uh, and so on. So everybody has their own little implementation of TLS. Probably the devices in this room actually are running little TLS stacks within them as well, which are proprietary. So there's tons and tons of implementations, and there are tons and tons of attacks on these implementations. Okay. There's also many, many security theorems about TLS, and we, we have seen a few. We will see more uh, tomorrow, maybe, about TLS. But there is actually a gap, like I said. The, the proofs are usually about somewhat simplified models of TLS, because when you're trying to do hand proofs, we are forced to make certain kinds of simplifications. And we'll see how, the, how these simplifications actually do not cover the whole thing. The protocol that at the level at which we want to consider it consists of four phases. The first is the negotiation phase called hello in, uh, in TLS. So you, the client and the server negotiate some parameters. Then they run the authenticated key exchange. And for the most part, we'll focus on this middle blob. And then they do a key confirmation step, which is called finished in TLS. And finally, now once they have the keys, they can start exchanging data. And this is your authenticated encryption phase, or the record layer, if you want to call it that. And the first phase, which is a negotiation phase, although it's kind of the most boring phase, has actually probably resulted in more attacks on, uh, realistic attacks on the protocol than, than many other features. And the idea is very simple. So the client says, here are all the protocol versions, all the cipher suits, all the signature algorithms, all the Diffie-Hellman groups, everything that I support, here it is. Okay, so you can say, I am a client, I, uh, here's my nonce, okay, it also includes a nonce. I am want to speak TLS 1.2, by which implicitly you mean that I support all the protocols under TLS, before TLS 1.2. I can do RSA, I can do Diffie-Hellman, I can also do elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Uh, I can do ASGCM, ASCBC, and RC4 for authenticated encryption. I can do uh, MD5 signatures, SHA-1 signatures, whatever. You can, you can give a whole bunch of things, and the server picks. The server chooses, okay, let's do RSA, let's do ASGCM, let's do TLS 1.0 or 1.1 or 1.2 or whatever. So if you look at it, there's actually TLS, when we talk about it as a protocol, we're lying. It's not a protocol, it's a protocol framework. There's a hundreds of possible combinations of choices through these algorithms that you can pick, and each one of them specifies what we would classically call a protocol. Okay? So each instance of TLS is a protocol, but TLS itself should be thought of as a framework that allows you to plug in any protocol you want. So today, tomorrow, if you come up with a post-quantum key exchange, you can just slot it in right here, and most of the protocol won't change. Okay? If you come up with a new AAD scheme, just slot it in right there, and most of the rest of the protocol can just work exactly as it did before. Sometimes uh, there have to be fundamental changes to the protocol, but often you can just plug things in. A new hash function, SHA-3, no problem. You can just plug it in, and it, it it'll, it'll still, the rest of the protocol structure remains the same. I'm not saying it's as secure as before. I'm saying that the structure of the protocol remains the same. So what this means is that when we are doing proofs of TLS or analyses of TLS, and we say that, okay, I proved that this particular mode of TLS is secure, we are only proving things about one mode of TLS. So what about all the other modes? Okay. Do we have to verify them all? Can we just verify some small curated subset? Can a bug in some unverified mode attack or break a verified mode of TLS? Now these are the kinds of questions that come up whenever you have this kind of agility in a protocol framework. And we'll see some of the examples that come up from there. But let's focus on the key exchange. There are two most popular key exchanges in protocol in, uh, in TLS. Classically, the most uh, popular one was uh, RSA key transport. And the idea was quite simple. The server would send you a certificate. And the certificate had a RSA public key in it, which you could use for encryption. The client would pick a secret called a pre-master secret PMS, encrypt it for the server, and send it over. And now that they both have the PMS, because only the server can decrypt the PMS, we can use uh, the, PM, uh, the PMS to derive uh, the session key using some PRF and the two nonces that we've exchanged. And using the session key, now we can finish the protocol, do key confirmation, then do authenticated encryption, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay? So here, if you look at the core construction here, is RSA encryption. But then you have to dig deeper to actually see what the, what the proofs mean, what the, where the attacks come from. The RSA encryption mode used in TLS up to TLS 1.2 is RSA PKCS11 uh, V1.5. Okay, so I just kind of, uh, it's, it's a PKCS uh, padding uh, or a, uh, encryption. So the actual encryption actually is not just raw RSA encryption, it's something like this. And the server is supposed to decrypt the uh, PMS. It's supposed to check the padding. It's supposed to check the protocol version. And this isn't the standard. And then it's supposed to compute the session key. Why it's like this? It's uh, the structure of the of the of the uh, of, PK, uh, of RSA encryption in TLS is historical. Whatever. There we don't really care about it. Uh, if you forget about the actual padding and so on, then in theory the security of this should only rely on the hardness of factoring for PQ, right? So if you cannot break up PQ into P and Q, this, is, this should be secure. In fact, uh, classic papers on, uh, on TLS, even s starting from the earliest versions in 1994, there were already proofs for how SSL was using RSA encryption. And it basically said, well, if RSA encryption is secure, then uh, good things happen. But in 1998, as many of you know, uh, Blackenbacher publishes a chosen ciphertext attack exactly on that padding uh, scheme that we are speaking of. And he showed, uh, and he and other people showed that uh, this actually breaks the way RSA encryption is used in SSL. So the protocol was fixed uh, in 2002, and there were mitigations in TLS and other protocols and so on, exactly for that particular attack that came up. Okay? And that's a cryptographic weakness, let's say a cryptographic weakness or a formatting weakness is a side channel attack on uh, RSA encryption at least in the way it's used in this protocol. So instead of removing that mode from the protocol, they just added mitigations against the side channel. Okay, so that's a very important design decision that they made, and it has proved to be wrong, because even though we can actually prove TLS, assuming that this mitigation is perfectly implemented, and many people have proved that TLS is secure if this mitigation is perfectly implemented, in fact, it's almost impossible to implement uh, correctly. Every time people have tried to mitigate this particular attack, uh, they have, they have messed up in the code in some way, because this particular kind of side channel is very hard to avoid just by secure coding practices. And this is like just the latest of many uh, attacks. In fact, there's one more even after this called Robot that came out late last year. And so this uh, kind of Black and Barker attack continues to be found again and again in, uh, in TLS. Um, let's hold that thought for a second. Let's move to the other uh, key exchange in TLS, which is now the more recommended one, which, uh, which is elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. And elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman is slightly different in, in the way it's done in TLS. Remember that in TLS, we are only caring about the server being authenticated. The client is rarely authenticated in TLS, okay? So the server, what it's going to do is going to send us a certificate like it did in the RSA mode, but it's also going to s uh, choose a, uh, a elliptic curve or a mod P Diffie-Hellman group. You have a choice. And it's going to sign whatever its choice of Diffie-Hellman group was, what elliptic curve it chose or what, what group it chose, with its private key. It's also going to sign its own Diffie-Hellman key share, g to the y. The client then sends g to the x, and we have g to the x, y. We can use g to the x, y as our pre-master secret, compute the session keys, and then do the exact same protocol after that. So this already shows you this protocol framework aspect. We just swapped the first two messages here to change the AKE. But the rest of the messages before, which was the hello, and the rest of the messages after, which are the finished, are exactly the same. They don't care where the, where the session key comes from. They just say, give me some session key, and I'm going to do the rest of the protocol from this point on. So as we all know, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, how it works, but uh, let's look at what the exact construction in TLS is. There, is uh, there are two aspects to this key exchange. There's a signature from the server. And the server is basically, if you're going to use a mod P Diffie-Hellman group, which is uh, integers mod P, uh, it's going to cover these things. It's going to cover the nonce from the client, the nonce from the server, the prime, the group uh, generator, and g to the y. Okay, that's what uh, the, the server signs. Then the client sends over g to the x, and then both of them can compute uh, g to the x, y. And in theory, uh, this uh, protocol can be proved secure as long as you take some Diffie-Hellman assumption into account, uh, proofs that rely on the computational Diffie-Hellman under some other assumptions, gap Diffie-Hellman, whatever your favorite one is, uh, which applies to the particular mode that you are, are trying to verify. So 
The classic protocol, again, was proved many times. In fact, even with all the details of the protocol thrown in for elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, for mutually authenticated DHE, there was a full proof in 2011. And in 2013, again, there was a proof of both RSA and DHE together in the same framework. And these basically showed that the way these constructions were working, assuming, of course, uh, resistance to Black and Bakker, that the whole thing um, uh, works well. And in 2015, there was an attack called Logjam, which showed how even though the core Diffie-Hellman construction in TLS is secure, when you combine it with other things that are happening in the real world of TLS, like Diffie-Hellman export and so on, and uh, some bugs that existed in the configuration of various clients and servers, bad things happen. Okay? So this pattern you can see over and over again in TLS. Right? So there is, uh, the protocol has hundreds of modes. Some of the modes are weak. And the cryptographic weaknesses in these modes are well known, are been known for maybe 20 years, or maybe even 30 years in some cases. Okay? So there are weak hash functions, there are weak Diffie-Hellman groups, and so on. But there are also strong modes for which we, we, we believe are secure at the current time. Okay? But then they combine that with some logical flaws in the protocol, which basically f allow you to do cross-protocol attacks, which are attacks from weak modes to strong modes, downgrade attacks, other things called transcript synchronization or collision attacks. And finally, there are implementation bugs that sort of expose these weaknesses uh, to, to the, to the real-world adversary. Okay? And these could be bugs in the crypto library, uh, in the packet parsing, in the state machines, and the configurations, and so on. And sometimes you need a combination of these, and a combination of these occurs in a perfect storm, and then there is a major sort of attack with has uh, a nice logo and a big, uh, uh, a big yeah, beautiful acronym, and it appears in all the newspapers. But of course, we should be trying to avoid all of these, right? So we should stop it already at the top, and if that doesn't happen, we should stop it here, and if that doesn't happen, we should stop it there. I mean, we shouldn't have to sort of wait for the perfect storm to appear to kind of break the protocol. So what we'll look at is some examples of what goes wrong here. And I'll take some it without going into too much of the details of, of the TLS protocol itself. And then we'll, we'll sort of look at tools that allow us to find uh, these kinds of flaws, to prove uh, the, uh, the pro protocols like TLS secure with, with machine check proofs, and finally also find uh, bugs and implementations or prove that your implementation itself is secure. Depending on how, how much time there is, we will go into detail or not so much detail on these, but I want to give you an overview of the kinds of tools that are available if tomorrow you want to design your own protocol or implement your own protocol and you want some assurance that this is, you actually got it right. Okay? <coughs> so let's start with some uh, attacks that are based on um, crypto weaknesses, uh, so to speak. And we look at weak Diffie-Hellman groups to begin with. So here's your classic, classic, classic protocol, everybody knows this, anonymous Diffie-Hellman, there is no authentication, g to the x, g to the y, we are computing g to the x, y. And we all know, even Wikipedia knows, that anonymous Diffie-Hellman has a man-in-the-middle attack. Okay. So the man-in-the-middle attack, if you want to remember yourself, is that the, the, the network attacker, I'm just going to call him the network attacker from now on, the network attacker basically uh, takes g to the x is coming from a to b, changes that to g to the x prime, where the network attacker knows x prime. And when the g to the y comes back, it changes it to g to the y prime, so the network attacker actually knows y prime. And now uh, there is a key on the left, which is g to, the, g to the x y prime, and on the right is g to the x prime y, but in fact the network attacker knows both those keys, because he chose the keys in both directions. So the network attacker can be a complete uh, uh, sort of proxy between the client and the server. And the reason this happens is, of course, because there is no authentication here. And there is a well-known way of adding authentication, there are many well-known ways of adding authentication to this protocol. Uh, let's just look at uh, one version, which is the version variant of Sigma. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to assume that A and B, uh, there is some public key infrastructure by which A and B know each other's public keys and they keep their own secret keys uh, to themselves. Uh, they have agreed upon the group that they're going to use. Uh, it's some standard strong group, let's say. They're going to do the G to the XY stuff, but then before uh, finishing the protocol, they're going to sign and Mac the messages that they have sent. And there are various possibilities. What do you sign and what do you Mac and so on? So here I've just chosen a mode where you're signing the entire transcript. So you're signing a hash of M1 and M2, and you're Macing your own uh, identity. So each person maps their own identity and signs the entire transcript. You could go the other way. You could sign just the Diffie-Hellman ephemerals, 
and then Mac the whole transcript. And that's another variant that you could use. But I've just chosen this because it sort of illustrates some points uh, that I have. So if you do a protocol like this, and you try to do a proof that it actually avoids most of the kinds of attacks you talked about, the man-in-the-middle attacks, um, you can prove that this is uh, secure. It gives you authentication, integrity, confidentiality, in almost any model you can think of. Of course, remember that we are using Diffie-Hellman here, and so we have to kind of think about what is the limits of the security of the protocol we set above. So the, the, the construction we are using there, which is a key derivation on top of g to the xy, relies on some, at the very least, on some Diffie-Hellman assumption on that group that we're using uh, for this uh, computation. So we want it to be the case, informally, that the attacker cannot compute the key without knowing one of g x or y. Right? And the best known attacks on uh, Diffie-Hellman uh, protocols uh, or Diffie-Hellman groups indeed involve computing the discrete log. And the discrete log basically means that if the attacker, given g to the y, can compute y, then he can break the protocol. And this is kind of obvious because he has obtained the, the key, effectively the private key of, uh, or ephemeral key of, the, of one of the parties. And therefore can pretend to be one of the parties, has all the capabilities that one of the parties in the protocol has, and therefore can uh, completely break the protocol. So and obviously in, uh, in this particular protocol, if the attacker is able to compute the discrete log of let's say g to the y mod p, he can uh, even if, uh, if the attacker can compute this after the protocol is over, he can go back and decrypt all the messages. So there is no forward secrecy if, obviously, in a certain way, this is the obvious attack, if the, discrete, uh, if the diffie hellman group was so weak that the attacker could compute the discrete log on it. Okay? This is uncontroversial. Everybody understands this, even if we sometimes forget that uh, the diffie hellman group has to be strong. So let's ask how, how strong does it have to be? Because this is now when we're getting into the concrete world that we have done the proof on paper, that if it is strong, everything is good. Now, when you're deploying it in the real world, now we have to ask some other questions. I say, okay, so what shall I use for the diffie hellman group? So these are the current di discrete log computation records, although I believe we are almost on the verge of breaking uh, the 768-bit prime, but let's say this is what we have right now. Uh, up to 2014 uh, primes up to a size of 596 bits have uh, been broken in the sense of people have been able to compute the discrete log for such primes. And the methodology they use for doing this typically is the number field sieve, and there are some variants of it that, uh, that, act, uh, that are better, and that it, there are other variants that work on non-prime fields, for on binary fields and so on, but for the most part we are concerned about prime fields, so let's, let's stay there. So now we're talking about standard mod p diffie hellman if you're talking about elliptic curves in fact the records are much uh, let's say uh, we haven't broken significantly strong elliptic curves yet but we're talking about mod p groups here and uh, if you ask well what what is the actual complexity of breaking such groups well there are various ways of answering that question these slides are due to nadia henninger so this if you look at the number fields sieve algorithm it sort of roughly looks like this the details you can go and read, it's all very interesting. So there are various phases to the computation, and uh, that is the actual sort of rough complexity of how, how long it takes. But you know, we are talking about the real world. We need to give people real numbers on what they should use. So here's another way of calculating it. You say, well, if you want to break a 512-bit Diffie-Hellman, it takes roughly 10 core years, where uh, a core is, well, if um, your machine has four cores, right? So one core year uh, is one year of one core. So uh, this is, again, and if you want to do 768 bits, it takes that much time, and that is an estimate for what you think about uh, 768 and 1024. 2048 bit Diffie-Hellman is considered as yet unbreakable in the sense that we don't even know how to correctly estimate how long it will take. <laughs> even that's not great because, you know, 10 core years, what does that mean? If I have, um, you know, 1 million cores, can I do it in a few seconds or not? Because it's not entirely parallelizable, right? So here's what the concrete answer is, which is that you can actually break down the computation into two phases, one which you have to do for the prime, and one which you can do for every g to the y. So one which is a pre-computation that you can do for a particular prime, if you know what prime you're going to attack. And then for every key that you want to do a discrete log on, there is a last phase, that's the phase on the right you have to do. And at least in 2015, when we tried to do this, for 512-bit Diffie-Hellman, it takes a f like 150 hours or something to do the first phase. So it's like several days to compute the first phase of the thing. 
And but then when you want to break individual keys, it takes about 70 seconds to break individual keys. And this is at the 512 bit level. Okay, so that's the sort of the, the, the highest kind of level at which we can efficiently break this right now. But it, it's only getting better. So people, I think, will break 768 bits very soon, and so on. Okay, and it, at state level adversaries, we don't even know how much it can go. So uh, this is roughly trying to give you an idea of how parallelizable they are. So th the first two phases are highly parallelizable. The linear algebra, which takes the longest time actually, which takes 120 hours, is the least parallelizable of the first phase. The last phase is somewhat parallelizable, but not so much. But you don't need much at that point. There's not so much computation to do. Okay. So linear, algebra? linear algebra is the bottleneck in this particular one. When you're factoring RSA, it's a different uh, set of things that. Uh, uh, that cross the bottleneck. All right, so that's just a little detour into the world of uh, cryptanalysis for discrete log, just to get a feel for how strong our, our protocol needs to be, or our Diffie-Hellman groups need to be. So now let's come back to the real world and say what, what do people actually use for Diffie-Hellman groups? So if you go and look at uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman in TLS in, in the world, and we did a scan in 2015, maybe the numbers are slightly different now, well, there's about, there were about 14 million hosts, about 25% supported uh, Diffie-Hellman, and there were 70,000 distinct groups being used. So there's a ton of groups, which is already a little bit worrisome because you don't know how many of these groups are chosen correctly, how many of them are actually chosen with terrible random number generators, and so on. And of these, about 84% uh, were using 1,024-bit primes, which from a cryptographer's viewpoint is already too weak, right? It's sort of... I mean, I gave you the numbers there, it's okay, it looks like a million core hours, but it's already too weak. But from a practitioner's viewpoint, this is sort of anything far m bigger than that is actually too slow because mod p uh, computations are big num computations, they're actually very slow. But in fact, some percentage of the internet, like say 90,000 90, or 100,000, were using even weaker primes. So when we asked the question, like, okay, I have this beautiful proof about TLS DHE which we have in the, in the standard model even, maybe if you're lucky, but if you're not lucky, then okay, in the, in the specific model specific to TLS called ACCE, then what does this proof apply to? Can I say I have verified TLS as it's there uh, online? At the very least, I have to say, well, it applies to maybe, I don't know, 97% of the internet, because at least 3% of the internet is, let's say, using groups which are like, uh, which, are, which, are, which are not going to satisfy the properties that we require. Okay, and this is kind of, these gaps, these 3% is sort of where the attacks are going to come from. But we'll see that using things like downgrades, we can expand that 3% to almost something like 20% or 25% in certain cases. Let's look at a second crypto weakness that we have to worry about a little bit, even in that simple Sigma protocol that we started off with. Okay, so let's go back to Sigma. Like I said, we are going to sign a hash of the transcript. And when I say assign a hash off, yeah, you know, all signature schemes that TLS supports at least, and most signature schemes that people use, implicitly hash the argument before signing it. So there's always a hash inside a signature. But in TLS, of course, you also hash before hashing in within the signatures. There's two levels of hashes. But it doesn't matter. Let's say you're, you're using some sort of hash function within your, within your signature scheme there. So you have to ask, well, what is this hash function? How strong does it have to be, right? So this is the kind of signature that TLS 1.3, SSH 2, TLS 1.2 client auth do. They sign a hash of the uh, message transcript. So how, uh, what can we use in the place of that hash function? And this is an interesting question because when you're doing our proofs, we have to decide what assumption do we put on that hash function for our proof. So almost all proofs of TLS and SSH and Ike and so on will immediately assume that the hash function is collision resistant. Okay, because it's just, this gives us the easiest sort of proofs. Okay, we just, and it's for us, we don't even think why would you use a non-collision resistant function, right? But you know, bear with me. So, but just for the tightness of the proof, you might want to ask, well, do I really need collision resistance, or do I only need second pre-image resistance? Okay, what do I actually need from that use of that hash function in that particular signature? And this is a this is an interesting sort of protocol analysis question, right? And the reason why those two, uh, the difference between those two matters in practice, well, we have to actually look at what hash function cryptanalysis is like right now. So a quick primer on 
on hash functions. Many of you already know this, of course. Typically, uh, many of the hash functions that we use, up to SHA-2 at least, follow the merkle damgard scheme. So essentially what you're going to do is you want, to, you want to hash this big message, which is M0, M1, M2, M3, and so on. So you're going to break it into blocks. And each block, you're going to run a compression function on. And then you're going to chain together the, the results of these compressions to finally get a hash value at the right. Okay? That's what we're doing. We want this hash function to, be, to behave like a random function, so we'll, for whatever that means. And in particular, we want it to be hard to, to be able to come back from a hash value to the, in the initial one, which is called pre-image, or to people, for people to find collisions. And we have to decide what we actually desire from this hash function, because we can make it weaker or stronger depending on what, uh, what our actual needs are. So the kinds of attacks that come on hash functions, the, the, the most sort of, the, the first level of attack is a, is a collision, uh, a collision attack, let's say. And a collision attack is basically going to be, can you find me M1, which is not the same as M2, such that both of them hash to the same value? We know that such values exist, obviously, because we're going from a large space to a small space. The question is, can I computationally find two such values which will hash to the same uh, uh, hash value? And if you give me a, uh, a hash function with, uh, with block size n, then there is a generic attack by which I can always find, uh, using the birthday paradox, uh, a collision with complexity 2 to the n by 2. So if you have a, a hash function like MD5, which is 128 uh, bit blocks, it's a 2 to the 64. For SHA-1, it's 2 to the, 2 to the 80. Okay. So that's known for, for a collision. But really, if you think about it, what we're asking is a question something like this, right? So, it's the, so the collisions that we're going to look for in the in this setting um, are more or less like this. So what you're going to do is you're going to find some set of blocks, P, P1, P2, P3. After that, you're going to say, let me find one block which collides. You know, le let me find two blocks which collide. So you can collide the two blocks. And then you can add the same text at the end. So you can always add text in the beginning and the text at the end. After adding the text at the beginning, you have to find the collision, and you can add any amount of text at the end. And that's the feature of the merkle damgard uh, structure. If I find two colliding blocks like that, the whole thing collides. And it turns out that to find this kind of thing on existing hash functions, there are shortcut attacks. I'm not an expert. Many of you can go read up on it. And for MD5, the complexity of finding a, ha a hash collision of this form is about 2 to the 16, which is trivial. It's seconds on a laptop. Maybe not even seconds, actually, microseconds. And for SHA-1, the complexity is, is uh, believed to be 2 to the 61, was recently broken after months and months of uh, computation. But that's the kind of attack that, uh, that's a kind of a classic collision attack. But classic collision attacks like that, sorry. Yeah, because we are preserving the length on both sides, sorry. So the, the thing is that, yeah, indeed, because there is a, there's a length at the end, uh, you have to make sure that both of the sides that you're colliding actually have the same length. So, and this is one way of making sure they have the same length. You're exactly replacing one block by another block. Everything else remains exactly the same. But this kind of collision is actually not so useful, except in very, very rare cases, because you have hardly any control about what C1 and C2 are going to do. You have very little control of what's going before and after because they have to be the same in both cases. So uh, they are not very useful for real-world attacks. But what are more useful are these things called chosen prefix collision attacks, where suppose you have two completely different messages, P1 and P2. They're completely different. And somebody gives you those two messages. You don't even control them. Somebody gives you two different messages. Can you find a series of blocks that, if you hash them together, will eventually collide back into the same, uh, into the same hash? And once you do that, of course, you can add any number of hashes at the end, as long as they are the same on both sides. So this is, for example, the kind of attack that, uh, that Stevens et al. used to break the uh, certificates that were signed with MD5, because you can start with a certificate that says google.com, or a certificate that says, I don't know, indria.fr, and I have the right to get a certificate for indria.fr, but not for google.com. And then I find some kind of collision that makes this whole hash uh, the same, and find a way of stuffing the collision block somewhere. And then I put the, the, the suffix of the certificate. And now I ask the certification authority, can you sign this, please? And it signs it. And, but in fact, I've got a signature for that. Because the same signature works for both. Because the signature is after, after hash. So chosen prefix collision attacks are 
are better or more useful, but the complexity is a little bit higher. So for MD5, the complexity is 2 to the 39. For SHA-1, it's almost as bad as the generic collision, which is 2 to the 80 for MD5, uh, for SHA-1. The, the chosen prefix collision comp uh, complexity is 2 to the 77. So you save a little bit more, but not so much. But for MD5, it goes all the way from 2 to the 64 down to 2 to the 39. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's fairly efficient. It can take about an hour maybe on your laptop. Of course, the, the, the property that is the holy grail of breaking a hash function is the second pre-image attack, where somebody gives you M1 and a hash of M1, you're going to find a completely different M2, well, somewhat different M2, which hashes the same M1. So you don't control M1, and somebody has given you a hash of it, so somebody gives you a certificate for Google, and you're able to construct a certificate uh, which will hash to the same thing as a certificate for Google. And that would actually com completely break the, uh, the guarantees of that certificate. And uh, this one, uh, the second pre-image attack, however, for most hash functions, most reasonable hash functions, uh, the best known attack is the generic attack, which has complexity 2 to the n, not 2 to the n by 2. So even for MD5, the complexity is 2 to the 128, which I would say is sort of uh, infeasible currently, and, and so on. So there's no practical attacks on, on the second pre-image for most of the hash functions that we, ca that we care about. So, if you're, so this is where we can come to come back to the question. So do we need collision resistance in your protocol, or do you need weak pre-image resistance? If you need weak pre-image uh, resistance, or second pre-image resistance, then you can even use MD5. That's completely fine. Yeah, you can use SHA-1, MD5, whatever you like, and then you don't have to change that. But if you're relying on collision resistance, today we don't want you to use MD5 or SHA-1 because they have, we have found collisions on them already and you're gonna, it only, it's only going to get better over time. So just a sort of summary, MD5, if you want to do common prefix or chosen prefix collisions, it's considered trivial. And generic collisions are harder. Uh, SHA-1... Uh, uh, the generic collisions are not yet doable, but common prefix collisions are doable. But in both cases, the second pre-image is considered completely infeasible. Okay. Sorry about the slide kind of bleeding down, but the slide should be there in your slide deck. So, yeah. Uh, is there a method of Is there a method that says uh, something that is uh, over root uh, secure for collision? I'm not aware of any such uh, uh, thing. Yeah, for MD5, it's already good. So um, I don't know. So for second pre-image, I think on most of the hash functions we're thinking about are pretty good right now. So let's go back to the question of uh, what do we need? Uh, do we need collision resistance or second pre-image resistance? In particular, let's make this concrete. Right now, TLS uses MD5, TLS 1.2 uses MD5 and SHA-1. TLS 1.1 uses MD5 and SHA-1. Uh, TLS 1.2 and SSH2 still uses uh, SHA-1 in many places. Is it safe? Or do we have to kind of get rid of SHA-1 in all these places? Right? That's a kind of very concrete question to ask, right? And in fact, on this particular aspect of what you actually need from the protocol, there is a disagreement between cryptographers and practitioners. And you can go read this uh, nice discussion section in that RFC 4270 between Schneier and Hoffman when the MD5 attacks first appeared a long time ago. And there, uh, Bruce Schneier is basically saying, yes, the attacks are, may not directly affect internet protocols, but we should immediately get rid of MD5 and move to SHA-1, and as SHA-2 standardizes, we should move to SHA-2. Whereas Paul Hoffman, who is kind of uh, an author on many internet standards, including IP various IPsec standards, says there is no proof that MD5, the MD5 attacks that have just come out, at that time they were just uh, standard collision attacks, affect TLS or SSH or IPsec. So there is no hurry to remove them. We should not just scare people because, uh, uh, because we think uh, that it could be a cryptographic weakness. And that, is, that kind of discussion shows you the exact division why things that in the, in the crypto community we might think of as obviously broken only get removed from protocols 20 years later. Because obviously broken is not obvious to, to most people, right? You have to demonstrate a concrete attack that actually breaks the protocol before uh, people sort of start saying, okay, this actually affects, uh, affects us. 
But sometimes these kinds of disagreements can be brought down to a technical question, which is what do we actually need from this uh, hash function? So let's go back to the transcript collision uh, so on the, the sigma protocol. And what we are asking is that, the, the, so down there we are hashing uh, the, the transcript, which is the message one and message two together. If I can find a collision on such transcripts, can I break the, can I break the protocol? And the answer actually is yes. So in fact, uh, the answer is that the cryptographers were always right and that the practitioners were wrong. You do need collision resistance. So we were not wrong to put collision resistance into our proofs. So it was not like we were just cheating and trying to take the easy way out. Actually, it was needed. To see why, why let's sort of enhance the protocol a little bit because it kind of makes it clearer. Uh, let's say that the messages uh, here contain g to the x and g to the y, but also some parameters okay, that they are going to send to each other. And the parameters have no role cryptographically in this protocol. They're just some stuff that you want to send to each other uh, in the, during the handshake or the key exchange protocol. And in fact, they will be included in the transcript. Okay? So the transcript includes message one and message two, and they're also signed. So you get some integrity for these parameters. This is your metadata. You get integrity via, via the signature. But in fact, for the, for the core crypto construction, they don't matter. Okay? And this is how most protocols work. There's always some junk that is being sent along with the, with the things that you consider important in your, in your crypto proof. So what we're going to ask is that, is it possible for the attacker to, to do the classic anonymous uh, Diffie-Hellman man-in-the-middle attack, even though there are signatures involved here? And the way it's going to do it is going to change g to the x to g to the x prime, and params a to params a prime, and vice versa. It's going to say change g to the y to g to the y prime, and params b to params b prime in a way that the hash of these two messages is equal to the hash of those two messages. If you can collide those two hashes, then in fact the signature which is on the hash of these two messages on this side can be just forwarded to the other side and it will work. And similarly the signature that, the, that B makes on that side can just be forwarded on this side. So you can bypass uh, the, the guarantees of Sigma which gives you the, the, the authentication step by colliding the hashes on which the signature is computed. So this is, um, this is to be expected, right? So the question is, can the attacker do this, right? And if he can, then in fact, uh, he can break the protocol. He can break the protocol in a pretty bad way because he can impersonate the server to the client, he can impersonate the client to the server, he can downgrade parameters. So depending on which variant of this attack you want to use, you get either a downgrade attack or, or client to server impersonation attack. So let's kind of focus on that aspect. How do you, how does the attacker uh, make sure that the hash of M1 with M prime two, which the attacker chose, is equal to the hash of M1 prime uh, with M2? So the first thing to observe that this is actually a collision and not a pre-image, because the attacker controls aspects of both transcripts. It's not like he controls only one transcript and he has to uh, kind of collide with the other one. He controls parts of both transcripts. Okay. So in particular. He knows the black bits and he has to compute the red bits. Okay. And if he can set this up as a generic collision, he's, he's already able to kind of break this for things like MD5 and uh, in some sort of uh, reasonable amount of time, let's say. But if he's lucky, he can set this up as a shortcut collision and we'll see, we'll see how, how that works. Now the reason why people did not believe that this could be actually accomplished in a practical way is that M1 and M2 both contain random nonces. So it's not like the server and the client are just sending the same data over and over again. They're actually sending random nonces in, in, in their messages. So how can the attacker sort of guess what the server, client and the server are going to send I, uh, early enough to compute the collision? So let's look at this. So what you're trying to do is this. The A is sending some message. Let's assume that the message is prefixed by some length that tells us what the length of this is. And that message is prefixed by that length. It contains g to the x in params A, and that's going to contain g to the y in params B. So the goal of the attacker is to compute M1 prime and M2 prime such that when you hash them together, it, uh, it, the hash is the same, right? And the critical problem is that he has to compute M1 prime and M2 prime, or at least M1 prime, before he has seen M2, okay? And that's the problem because uh, I don't know what, I may not know what G to the Y is, so how can I compute this collision which has to work on the whole thing without having seen M2? And this is kind of the reason why people thought that since there is randomness and freshness in the second message of, uh, of TLS, IQ, IQ2, and so on, that this kind of collision might be hard to compute. 
So uh, let's take a first simple example. What if the second message actually did not have anything fresh? Suppose the server was always using the same Diffie-Hellman uh, key, you can either a static Diffie-Hellman key or was using reusing the ephemeral key like many uh, TLS servers used to do. And what if the nonce that the server is choosing, is actu there's actually no nonce that the server is choosing, it just reflects back the client's nonce or computes it, the server nonce based on the client's nonce. It's not, not fresh, it's predictable. Okay? Then all the parts of the second message become predictable. Okay? This does not really occur in any real world protocol, but it could, you know, in, in a variation of quick that does not use server nonces, this could happen. But uh, let's just use this as an example. If that were the case, if the message two were completely predictable, then what the attacker would do is he sees the message one, he can guess what the message two is going to be, and he starts guessing, he starts sort of uh, throwing in options for mes uh, message one prime. He just chooses an X prime and a nonce one and computes the hash. And he sees, do they collide? If not, tries another one, tries another one, tries another one, and so on. And if he uh, keeps trying random nonces like this, this is a generic collision, in about 2 to the 64 tries for MD5 and 2 to the 80 tries for a SHA-1, he's going to find a collision. It's a generic collision he's going to find, and he's going to be able to then say, ah, this is the message I should send. He's going to send that message to the server, and we're going to get transcript collision. He's going to get client impersonation, server impersonation, everything breaks. But this is still kind of hard, right? 2 to the 64, even for MD5, is already kind of uh, a little bit much. And in fact, in most real-world protocols, that g to the y down there is going to be an ephemeral key that has been freshly chosen. And there's also going to be some kind of nonce in there maybe, but let's just forget about the nonce for now. Let's just say there's a g to the y which is freshly chosen, so it's actually like a nonce as well. But let's assume now that the client and the server have this sort of parameters, right? Some, some sort of blob that comes at the end of the message. So the message consists of a length, a fixed length ephemeral key, and some arbitrary length blob at the end. And both messages are of that form. Let's also assume that the lengths of these messages are known. I mean, every time I connect to Google, I see that the message coming down is always of the same size, so I know what the length is, for simplicity. So now, the problem is harder because the server's messages are not predictable, um, and we, uh, we want to try to be a little bit more efficient. So let's say, well, how do we compute this attack, uh, this collision? So it turns out you can still do it if you have this kind of a blob in these messages, which is an arbitrary length blob, which is ignored by the, by the recipient. And what you do is when the attacker sees message one, he immediately starts constructing both message one prime and message two prime in parallel. Okay, he's not even seen message two yet, but he's going to start constructing both messages. He's going to construct the first message such that he's going to uh, have a g to the x prime, then he's going to fill it up with zeros until he comes up to here. He's also already going to choose g to the y prime here, up to here. And from this point on, uh, he's going to try to find a colliding block. This is a, is, this is a chosen prefix collision. So there's one prefix over here, there's another prefix on the other side, and then he's trying to find C1 and C2 in a way that the whole thing uh, collides. Importantly, this is not yet a complete message. Okay? We have left some room at the bottom of this message, and we have not yet completed the M M2 uh, prime message, but the M1 prime message is complete. We have completed, written a complete message up there. So now the attacker can send the message on the right to, the, to B, say, okay, that's the message I want you to send. B is going to look at that message, it's going to take G to the X prime, it's going to ignore blob A prime, because that's just useless, it's going to throw it away. And then B is going to send its own message, which has a nice ephemeral key G to the Y. And what uh, the attacker is going to do, is going to stuff B's message into the blob of the message it was constructing on this side. Okay. So there was this blob inside which we just stuffed the message uh, that came from B. And if you do that, since we already had a collision up to that point, and since the message, the, uh, the suffix from that point is the same, we just stuffed the same message on both sides, the, by the merkel damgard property, the whole thing collides as well. So we have managed to compute a collision, a chosen prefix collision, just by looking at the first message. Totally relying on the fact that there is this nice big blob there which will get ignored by the recipient. So it only works for if you, if you have that. Okay? But the great thing is there's a chosen prefix collision. So uh, in MD5, it'll take 2 to the 39 co computations to solve, and SHA-1 will take 2 to the 77. But let's say 2 to the 39 sounds more exciting. So if you have MD5 signatures in your protocol, in your Sigma protocol or Sigma-like protocol, yeah? Why are the blobs there? The blobs? Yeah. 
So think of the blobs as, in TLS, the extensions. So there is a bunch of extensions that TLS protocol has. IPsec has similar things. Uh, all, all protocols have a bunch of these uh, places. Even X509 certificates have places where you can have arbitrary, uninterpreted stuff, which are meant for some use cases. But if you don't interpret that, if, if you don't understand that extension, if you don't understand this particular field, you're supposed to ignore it. So I can always start a blob with extra xxx equals open string, blah. And then the, uh, the, uh, the recipient is supposed to ignore this because uh, it doesn't understand what extra xxx means. Okay? Almost all of these uh, internet protocols have these extensib extensibility points. And that's what I think of as this blob. Did I? Yeah. Right. So um, mm, you have keen eyes. I, I wasn't going to explain that, but <laughs> uh, right. So in uh, TLS 1.2, the finished messages use a MAC, but the MAC is then truncated to 96 bits. And if you are in a scenario where the key that is used in the Mac is actually also known to the man-in-the-middle adversary, and there are scenarios in which that is the case, and he all he wants to do is collide the transcripts on the two sides, then effectively the HMAC becomes like a hash function with 96 bits, and so it takes about 2 to the 48 computations to find a collision on the transcripts on the left and the right. So you can use that to remount some renegotiation-style attack um, on, on TLS, which relies on the finished Macs being used as a transcript, because uh, they're using a truncated HMAC there, uh, and so on. So it's not a collision on HMAC, it's a collision on a truncated HMACs when the key is known to the adversary, which is a very limited kind of uh, uh, use case. All right, so uh, summary, if you use MD5 signatures in your protocol, and your protocol is like a Sigma-like protocol, which, you know, or I can't imagine any, any protocol that uses signatures, then most likely there will be a transcript collision attack that is exploitable. Now, you can avoid it by doing a protocol design in a very specific way, but we've looked at a lot of designs, and it looks like it's very hard to avoid. And let's look at in the real world, what is this actually relevant? Well, up to TLS 1.1, TLS uses uh, a mixture of MD5 and SHA-1 uh, hashes for RSA and SHA-1 hashes for DSA. So depending on how broken do you think SHA-1 is, you might want to say, well, no, you can't, you can't use them anymore because uh, depending on the strength of your adversary, uh, those could be considered broken. But okay, 2 to the 77, you might be willing to live with that because TLS has so many other problems which are worse, right? Uh, TLS 1.2, however, interestingly, this is a, a regression problem in TLS 1.2. In TLS 1.2, they wanted to introduce SHA-2 and they wanted to leave open the possibility that one day people might want to add SHA-3, SHA-4, whatever, new hash functions, right? So they introduced a new extensibility point called an extension, or the signature algorithms extension, where you can negotiate what signature and hash function you want to use. So you can say, I want RSA with SHA-1, as usual, or RSA with SHA-256, 384, 512, whatever, right? So you can choose whatever you want. But they threw an MD5 in that set, which, may, which means that in TLS 1.2, you can negotiate an RSA with MD5 signature, whereas in TLS 1.1, you could not. In TLS 1.1, your RSA signatures were on a combination of MD5 and SHA-1, but in TLS 1.2, you could negotiate an even weaker signature hash algorithm. This, I think, was a bug in the spec. They should have clearly said, do not use RSA with MD5. In fact, don't use anything with MD5, because at that point, it was well broken. MD5 was well broken already. But this kind of slipped in there. And by the way, ECDSA signatures still only uh, are supposed to use SHA-1 according to the TLS 1.2 spec, although there are extensions to the spec which allow you to use SHA-256, as you should. So what this means is that if you're using TLS 1.2, and in particular if you're using uh, client signatures in TLS 1.2, uh, and you're allowing MD5 signatures, there is, a, uh, there is an attack by which the client can be impersonated to the server, exactly in the, in the form that we looked before. Now this brings us to the question as about, okay, so you said that TLS 1.2 had MD5, it also has SHA-256 though. And in fact, almost everybody who uses TLS 1.2 uses SHA-256 for everything. Everywhere in the protocol you use SHA-256. Okay, some places you also use, you can use if you want SHA-512, but most people use SHA-256. 
So why does it matter that TLS 1.2 allows MD5 as long as everybody supports SHA-256 and is willing to use SHA-256 and would prefer to use SHA-256? And this is where we get into the problem where we can amplify attacks on weak crypto modes to attack strong crypto modes. So in various places in TLS and protocols like this, you're them, them, uh, there are places where you have weak modes and strong modes, and if you have a downgrade attack, you can take the weak mode and attack the strong mode. And a downgrade attack is actually a logical flaw in the protocol. This is, so this is where I would like to draw a line, saying up to now we've been talking about classic crypto weaknesses. And now we want to say, OK, but what, can, what are the kinds of weaknesses that are in the protocol design itself, which are more like logical uh, flaws that, that could lead to attacks? So the first one I'm going to look at is downgrade. That's right. So this is a form of downgrade, but uh, we'll see. Um, uh, but the params there were not participating in the crypto protocol itself, right? So they were just some. He was just. It's like an integrity attack here, where he's just able to change the param parameters, but they had no impact anywhere later. We were not using the params for anything. Yeah, but we're not using it to compute the keys. The security of the keys is not affected by uh, the the params. The security of the uh, the signatures is not affected by the params just yet. Does that hash on TI and TV, does it include the cipher speed negotiation? It does include the, the negotiation, but so far we have not actually negotiated a cipher suite. We're just throwing in a blob at the end, which we are saying ignore, right? But indeed, the intention there is that that is going to contain cipher suites, and that's where the downgrade is kind of kind of kind of come from. Yes, just sort of. I'm just trying to separate out the. Uh, the, the bug, one bug from another bug. So, am I almost done with my hour? Um, you're in minus three minutes. <laughs> so you can have three more minutes. You have three minutes over. Three minutes over. I'm three minutes over? Yeah, good time to break. Okay, let's break. <laughs>